there's these numerous, numerous verses that are essentially calling for unity amongst people of faith. Now, there will be differences, and that's okay, and that's fine. There will be differences in practice, perhaps slight differences in, in beliefs and in, uh, ideological positions, but the overwhelming ground that we have to share is common, and it can lead to unity. Hey, what's up Seekers? How you doing? We are having so much fun here at the channel and our viewers and subscribers are growing exponentially. It is really cool. Thank you to all of you who have joined. All of you, a thousand subscribers now, a thousand people that believe that love is more powerful than hate and that hope more powerful than despair and unity more powerful than enmity. So thank you for joining us and I just want to let you know that we have recently put up a Patreon page where if you would like to be a super duper fan you can join that and over there we'll upload all the content a couple days early so you can get a sneak peek and put all of the full unedited material. But now for this interview we have a fantastic fantastic brother and friend Isan who has joined us on the channel. Isan runs his own podcast and YouTube channel which I will put a link to all that in the description, Soul of Islam and Isan Alexander on YouTube. In today's conversation, oh, it's Panda. Hey, Panda. You want to say hi to the Seekers? <laughs> in today's conversation, we are going to talk about spirituality, inner life, the true meaning of religion. We're going to talk about the place of Islam in world traditions. We're going to talk about religious individualism, pluralism, and we're going to talk about how we personally can embody the messages which we are trying to bring to the world. It is a fantastic interview with a great, great friend, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, how you doing, Isan? I'm good, alhamdulillah, as we would say, uh, praise be to God. Uh, how are you doing, Zim? Fantastic, fantastic. We would say Baruch Hashem. Blessed be God. It's been, it's been a really good, it's been a really good week. Yeah, Where I'm sure you're watching the news and the, the United States seems to be imploding in on itself at the moment. <laughs> yeah, do you know what, actually, COVID I, I like I took upon myself a vow a few years ago to not watch or read like the news at all. But yeah. I hear I mean there's some things that you just can't not find out about. And I hear yeah. from my friends and I hear from from all that's going on. It's it's yeah, in fact, well that's a very good position to have in terms of staying away from the news. I've gotten sucked into it a little bit. I, I did the same thing. I've gotten sucked into it a little bit more lately with uh with you know, with the presidential elections and with what's happening with uh, Trump and and then now, so it, but it is, it is actually quite unhealthy and toxic. And I'm again, just today, I was thinking it's time to literally uh, begin to detox from, from a lot of this as well, because yeah. it's, it's not conducive. Yeah. I mean, I guess yeah. there is an advantage to staying informed and, and being, you know, with, with the now knowing what's happening. But, but I feel like the really important things you'll find out inevitably. And just like so much of the news is there just to, create more fear and more aggression and no, like no. i just I don't, I don't see it as a as a healthy thing right part of part of what i've felt is maybe it's important to stay a little bit more aware of kind of what's trending just to be current in terms of content mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um but yeah but actually i'm beginning to find it's it's not really doesn't really work well that way because you get pulled into it and it's it's not right. healthy right so I think let's uh, let's kick right off. I, your, your time is precious. So Isan, um, welcome on the channel. Such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so, so much. It's a real blessing that you joined us. And I had a chance over the past week or two to listen to some of your material on your Soul of Islam podcast, which I have to say, even coming as an outsider, as someone who doesn't identify as Muslim, I felt so elevated and so inspired by, by the material that you've been putting out. And it, it was so authentic and, and genuine and, and real. And I, I really appreciate that. So, so thank you for, for what you're doing, firstly, uh, for all of us. Well, th thank you, Zevi. I appreciate that. Um, that means a lot, really, because I don't necessarily get a lot of direct feedback. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's great to hear. I'm very grateful and humble that, that, that you found it like that. I've also tuned into some of your work in the last week since we've connected. And uh, also very happy and very pleasantly surprised. And I'm learning a lot myself. Oh, wow. In terms of the uh, 
interrelatedness and, and the sort of the the concurrent um, how do I say this the parallel depth of of you know mysticism and spirituality within our two different traditions it's been beautiful to see oh wow and you're I'm doing so... great work so thank you may, so much may God Almighty continue to support you thank you so much that means a lot that means a lot particularly coming from someone like yourself who is you know very well aware of your tradition thank you so much I want to I, I want to come back to talk obviously about about our respective traditions and, and where they perhaps meet and where they could inspire one another. But I want to first know about who you are. I want to hear your story. If you'd care to, to share, who, who is this son? Who is, who is this beautiful person in front of us? Yeah, I, I don't normally speak too much about myself, which is a, is a, which a lot of people probably are, I get a lot of comments about my background. And I just tended to not really say much about myself. So it's not something I do very well and I'm not very comfortable with it, but I'll be happy to spend a few minutes just so your, your audience uh, has a basic idea. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ahsan, and that name was actually given to me by my teacher, by my, what we would call our sheikh, uh, my spiritual teacher, my guide, my, my mentor. And my original name is Emil. Um, so I, I grew up in Los Angeles in the United States. My family had immigrated from abroad, from Central Asia, Afghanistan, in the late 70s, in fact, in the early 80s, uh, right at the cusp of 79, 80, as a result of the invasion of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Um, so I grew up, you know, pretty much uh, in the in the Southern California climate and environment. And, you know, my family, although they identified as Muslim, they were not particularly practicing, right? So I really didn't grow up knowing much about religion and spirituality other than the most basic things, that we believe in one God and that according to Islamic belief, Jesus is not God or the Son of God, but a prophet of God. And that was like really all I knew. But I, but I do recall, you know, I always had sort of a spiritual inclination. Like I remember even in high school, going back and looking up books on meditation and spirituality and, and, and so on. But it was only in, high, in college when I began to actually study religion a little bit more seriously. My first year of college as part of our educational curriculum, the humanities program that I was enrolled in, we were required to read and study the source scriptures of the three major monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as well as other material as well. And that was the first time that I actually began to read the source scriptures up until now. And, and this is, I think, that some, a lot, something we tend not to do, or people generally tend not to do. They, they tend to sort of just take their religion from you know, people around them at, at a very basic level, but seldom, I think, do people actually dig deep into the origin and to the source of the traditions that they've inherited. And me doing so was really revelatory. It was incredible because, I, again, I, I came from a position of not really knowing too much, but of course, having friends, you know, very multicultural uh, upbringing and experience. A lot of people in, in, in college, that's a time where a lot of people begin to discover religion. So I had a lot of friends that were kind of becoming born again Christians. I've always had Jewish friends. And, you know, what I began to see is that the things that I was being exposed to amongst friends was very different than what the actual source scriptures mm. were saying. And you get this idea, not studying the original material, that these religions are very different. Right? Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and they're almost competing in a sense. And I, I saw the exact opposite. I saw them as being beautifully parallel, harmonious, complementary, and really of the same source. It was undeniable for me. And I, at that point, I just really fell in love with spirituality, with religion. And uh, I, took, I started taking as many courses as I could in historical Jesus, in religious studies, and also as well as my personal study. Um, and that was great. You know, it was, it was a beautiful and illuminating time. And um, I began also looking for more depth in Islam, because for me, now that really hold everything together. I began looking for more depth. And uh, of course, the students on campus who I was now friends with, uh, the Muslim Student Association and so on, you know, beautiful people, wonderful people, but I knew there was more. And so I began looking around and seeing who I could sort of study and learn, you know, the religion on a deeper level. And uh, I kind of got co-opted into a, a group that I found at the mosque, which, uh, you know, good people, well-intentioned, but over time, keeping company with them, I began to realize that something's not balanced. And it was very outward focused, very extrinsic, very, mm. you know, piety was essentially equated with, with the things that piety, I guess, normally are equated with, with your identity, 
and with physical practice. And something seemed to be, you know, deeply missing, which was reality, spirituality, sincerity. So I didn't have enough or much knowledge at that time. I don't have much knowledge now either. <laughs> you know, I, I consider myself really a, at the beginning of the journey, to be honest, in a strange way, and a student, even though I've been studying this stuff for 20 years now. But I knew that there was something missing, and I, my soul was, was finding a lot of discomfort with the way that religion was being presented, and also really with the way that the concept of God was being presented. Mm. Right? As, as a God, as a creator that, that is very judgmental, harsh, angry, and, and it wasn't something that my soul could agree and resonate with. In the beginning, I was worshiping and praying to God out of love. I just, nobody told me you have to pray or you're going to go to hell. I found it. I began studying the religion and I said, okay, what's next? What do I need? What, what can I do now? Mm-hmm. And then they said, this is the prayer. And I began to learn how to pray and, you know, take wudu or make ablutions, pray and so on. And I did it just because of, I just felt like the most natural thing to do. But somehow this expression of Islam or religion or faith as compulsory began to somehow actually push me away from God. And I began to feel a real sort of darkness growing in my soul. And I began to make a prayer to God that, that he guide me to someone that I can trust. Because I began to see there are many different interpretations in religion. There are many different approaches and paths within. And I, I was beginning to see some may not be as safe as others. And so I began to make this prayer. And it wasn't long after that I was contacted by a family member that a, a particular sheikh was going to be coming giving a discourse in Southern California. And I, I would probably be interested. So I went to check it out. And that was my first exposure to, it wasn't my first exposure to what is now normally called Sufism, but rather my first exposure to this particular lineage and manifestation of, of what is called Sufism. And I put that in quotations because that really requires a little bit of explanation mm-hmm. as to what is Sufism. But what I found was everything I'd been seeking. Mm-hmm. I saw a perfect balance between the outer and the inner dimensions of Islam, between practice and between spirituality. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, very quickly realized this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm seeking. And, and it wasn't long before I formally took hand, which is a, which we would say, initiation or a commitment to really study with you know a particular teacher and lineage of teachers that are connected in an unbroken chain of transmission directly back to the prophet muhammad and peace be upon him and may peace be upon all of the prophets and messengers of god so uh really things happened very quickly and um within those first few months it came to my heart to ask our teacher uh, for a name, for an Islamic name, because at that time, a lot of people were embracing Islam through him. It was just such a luminous and, and amazing human being, one of these saints of God, these awliya that we would say in Arabic. And uh, I, I, was, I was amazed. I would see people crossing the street just to meet him mm. because they were so attracted by that, by that, by that prophetic light. Mm. And um, a lot of people were embracing Islam at that time and, and, of course, asking or being given, you know, Islamic names and so on. And it just came to my heart because my name, although it's a traditional Afghan name, Pashto name, it's not an Arabic name. And he always was wondering, like, he would always say it in such a way that, you know, like struggle with it a little bit and, and trying to make it an Arabic name. Mm-hmm. And it never quite fit. Mm-hmm. So finally came to my heart, asked, asked the Sheikh for a name. And he immediately, I said, you know, Sheikh Maulana, do you, do you have a name for me? And immediately, without even thinking, without a hesitation, he said, Ihsan. Just like that. And it was a kind of a scary thing for me to do because you're going to someone to really, um, you know, I think as human beings, really, Zevi, we're all looking for ourselves. Mm-hmm. We're looking for who we truly are, for our identity. And I, I think the one thing that can truly have an impact on our sense of self is our name, especially yeah. when it is given to us by a spiritual teacher or a spiritual master. Because there's also this understanding that really a a true teacher can see a human being and know them really at the core of their being. And this was shown to me very clearly through my shaykh, you know, through real clear and direct experience that what I had been seeking my whole life to be seen, to be known, I came across a human being that could see me and that I felt may know me. But there was this fear in terms of asking for a name because I thought, what if he gives me a, a name? that I don't resonate with, that doesn't fit me, that doesn't suit me. 
And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of that apprehension. But as soon as he said Ahsan, which is, I hadn't even considered that name. And I hadn't heard him give that name really to anybody else. Mm. There's a lot of people coming in and they were being given names, Abdul Rahman, Abdullah, Abdul Rahim, and so on. You know, beautiful names, but I didn't feel a personal connection to, to them myself in terms of if this was my name, what would it be? As soon as he said that, it was like this, this deep calm and serenity immediately filled my heart. And I didn't, I, I had an idea of what the word meant, but I had to look it up. And, you know, it was just, a, I, I suppose it felt to me right. It felt to me perfect. And I'm sorry, I said I wasn't going to say too much. Uh, no, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm loving that you're sharing. It's so beautiful. The, uh, and what I've come to find over time is what, what that word means. It means excellence or spiritual excellence. And it is a term that was described or is, it was a description of Islam that the Prophet ﷺ gave when he was describing the religion in a really incredible exchange and encounter between him and Angel Gabriel mm. in which he was sitting and a man came to the Prophet of Allah ﷺ dressed in beautiful white, a beautiful beard and you know, it didn't look like there was any signs of travel even though nobody recognized him. And I won't go into the whole tradition now, but, but the first part of that tradition is he began to ask the Prophet in a very close and comfortable way, sitting right in front of him directly, knee to knee. And this really surprised the companions of the Prophet. He began to ask him, O Messenger of God, what is Islam? And then the Prophet gave the five pillars of Islam. And he said, and then he says to him, you are correct. You are correct. And the, the companions, of course, were quite surprised that a man that they've never seen before, and they've been with the Prophet day and night, is now questioning and quizzing the Prophet and then telling him he's correct when he answers have you heard this ever before? Is that this, this tradition? I, I heard it on your podcast, actually, just listening to your oh, okay. material. Okay. It was such a beautiful story. I'm so glad I'm just you're going repeating to briefly, it. Uh, and I'll just briefly, just maybe for context. And please, for, do, for the yeah, audience. please do. Please um, do. And then, of course, the, the, the man asked the Prophet of Allah, in the five pillars, of course, to, to bear witness that there is one God. Muhammad is his last and final messenger. You know, the, the prayers, the five prayers fasting in the month of Ramadan, giving zakat, which is the charity, and of course, hajj. And then the man asked the Prophet of Allah, what is iman? Which, is, which means what is faith, right? This inner aspect of the, of the religion. You've got the outer practice. Now he's now going inward. And he says, what is iman? And the Prophet ﷺ said, to believe in God, the one, to believe in the messengers and prophets of God, all of them, to believe in the holy books that have been revealed to humanity, to believe in the angels of God, to believe in destiny, good and bad, and to believe in the, the day of accounting, the day of judgment. And then, of course, the man again says to him, you're correct. And then he asks him, Messenger of God, what is Ihsan? And the Prophet of Allah then said, it is to worship God as if you are seeing God, as if you are continually in the presence of God. Mm. And even if you are not seeing God, to know that he is seeing you, so he was giving this really beautiful description of the state of the highest level of development within faith and religion within Islam, which is to exist in a state of consciousness where you are perpetually aware of the presence of God with you, imminent as being the pervading, all-encompassing presence, to be aware of that. And of course, as you know, Zavi, God says in the Quran, I am nearer to you than your jugular vein. And, and yet, as human beings, we tend to not experience that. We tend to be very absent-minded in terms of our closeness to God. And that really is because we're absent. We're actually not here. Right? We are generally lost in, in our minds and in our thoughts in the past and in the future. And so seldom actually here in the present moment. So this really is the summary of the journey. It's to arrive here where we are. In terms of, and this is the goal of Islam and spirituality and Sufism, really what would be called awakening, to arrive at a point where one can transcend the self and the ego and become fully present here and now, and then begin to experience the presence of God and ultimately come to know God, which, which I believe, and based on other traditions and revelation, is really the purpose of our creation, ultimately to come to know our Lord and Creator. Mm. Thank you so much, Hassan. That was really, really beautiful. It was such a beautiful encapsulation of your own story and your spiritual path. And really the, the aim of, I feel more than just this, the path of the Muslim, but the path of every spiritual human. And while you were speaking, 
I sort of have a comparativist mindset. And I was thinking about how in Jewish teachings we speak about Shiviti Hashem the Negdatame, that we have this obligation to place God in front of us at all times, that to see everything in front of us as a manifestation of God. And the, the line that you said about God being as close as one's own throat, there was a I think Augustine in the confessions, right? That God is closer to me than my own self is. So mm. I, I I find myself in such an incredible space, and the world is in such an incredible space where we have a capacity really for one of the first times in human history, at least at a broad scale, to be able to share and talk and express the true depths of our own spiritual and religious traditions with one another. And and no longer in no longer in a sense of competition or superiority or or challenge, but in the sense of moving together towards a united goal, towards, you know, the one God, which is really incredible. Is is that something that you're seeing in your spiritual path as well? I'm, I'm curious to see how that looks for you. Yeah, absolutely. I do see that beginning to become, again, another a possibility. And also, um, it wouldn't be the first time. This has happened in periods in human history, in religious and faith-based history, uh, where, and I, I think you're actually probably more familiar than this with this than I am in terms of a lot of the harmony between scholars of various different faiths and traditions, how Jewish uh, scholars and rabbis were very close with Islamic ones as well, especially like in Andalusia and Spain and perhaps in, in periods within the Ottoman Empire even. But we've lost that, unfortunately, now. And, we, and this even goes back further to the early phase and early history of Medina when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, emigrated into Medina. He sought to create a society and an a environment that was not homogeneous, that was, that was, that was diverse, mm. that honored all the people of Scripture and, and of the book and, and tried to demonstrate the possibility of, of Jews and Christians and Muslims living together in harmony and not needing, right? So there's this mindset, uh, which is become really surprising to me, this idea that, because it wasn't the original way of the, of the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi to convert others to Islam, for example. It was rather to see the commonalities, to see the difference, and to unite. And the Quran itself specifically says, all people of the book, right? All people of scripture come to terms that we worship the one God, the God of Abraham, Noah, Moses, Abraham, and Jesus. Like, so there's, there's these, numerous numerous verses that are essentially calling for unity amongst people of faith and that unifying principle being faith and belief in the one god now there will be differences and that's okay and that's fine there will be differences in practice perhaps slight differences in in beliefs and in, uh, ideological positions but the overwhelming ground that we have to share is common and it can lead to unity. And I think that, you know, one of the great tragedies is that we have in general, even as, as religious people, faith-based people, fallen into the trap of division and, as you said, competition and ultimately conflict, hmm. where the real enemy is not people of faith, but it is the opposite of faith, which would be tyranny and oppression and abuse of human right. beings. Right. You know, I'm so I'm so curious to know on on both sides of that spectrum. One, what you think happened historically that we sort of drifted away from that original ideal of people together, people of the book, people of faith serving God in their own diversity, but but unified. I'm wondering how how we lost that historically, and I also I'm I'm very curious to know about how you find your own spiritual practice today, because I see that, and and perhaps these questions will be related. I see one of, one of the beauties of your own project is that it's so deeply rooted in your Muslim tradition. And it's not some sort of wish-washy, universalistic, kumbaya practice. It's really very much rooted in the Quran and in the Hadith and in the, in the tradition of, of your people. And I think there's a real, a real need for that. And, and I want to, so I want to ask you about both of those. How did, how did we lose that spirit of um, ecumenicism, of, of a shared brotherhood? And then how do we maintain our own spiritual identity and individuality within a pluralistic universal context of spirituality. I think that I would say that we lost the spirit of, of that harmony, that, that beauty, because I think we lost the spirit of religion hmm. of, of our faiths and our practices and our traditions themselves. 
they became more sources of just pure identity mm. rather than paths to light and beauty and excellence and to the presence of God. How are we ever going to approach God? Right? That is the purpose of religion. That's the fundamental purpose of religion is to connect the human being or lead them back to the creator. Because if we believe in an original fall from grace or an original error, or original mistake, whatever it was that led to us being here and out of the presence of God, religion is meant to serve as the means back to that state of grace. And simply taking religion as an identity, as a, as an augmented sense of self is actually serving the opposite purpose of religion. Because ultimately faith and spirituality are meant to guide a human being beyond the self. Right. And right. yet, unfortunately, it becomes a, a means of aggrandizing or, or augmenting the self through uh, cultural or, or communal association. So I think that the spirit of faith and traditions were lost. And then, of course, with that was lost the fruit of faith and religion and spirituality, which is harmony, which is beauty, which is light and love, mm. which is excellence. So I think, honestly, what I'm trying to do, what I feel the need to do, and I think may perhaps, you know, inshallah, God willing, many amongst other traditions also beginning to realize, to come back to the essence of the tradition, to come back to its source, its spirit, its soul, which is ultimately light and love and beauty and excellence. That would make it possible, right, to, to love one another and and. Unity doesn't mean sameness. Right? There's a beautiful verse in the Quran in which uh, Allah Almighty says, I, O children of Adam, first of all, he says, O children of Adam. So addressing everybody, but as the same, because we're all children of Adam. Right? So we're all part of this one description by God, the children of Adam. Right. O children of Adam, I have created you into different nations and tribes. I have made you into different nations that you may come to know one another, right? And I talk about this in some of my uh, content that really means to come to love one another, mm. to transcend the differences, to see beyond them, yeah. to see beauty in the other. And that is the path to God. I don't remember who it was. I believe maybe it, was, it may have been Gandhi, if I'm not mistaken. I have to double check. But somebody, one of these great illuminated human beings said, if you don't see God, in the face of your neighbor, your friend, or the other, you know, you're not there yet. You haven't quite yeah. arrived. And that's what we have to be able to do is to see the divine and the creator in everything that lives in all human beings, yeah. let alone in, in all animals and all plants and trees and rocks and minerals in the entire universe. It's a manifestation of the creator's light and will and life. And so really, I think if we can return to that excellence we can begin to experience the beauty of life as it was meant to be, to work together towards common happiness and harmony, to honoring and protecting one another from the real danger, which is evil, which is oppression and abuse and corruption mm. and tyranny and injustice. Mm. I feel like that's such an important message, particularly for right now, where there's so much hatred and animosity and like real senseless conflict. And that sense of, of needing to see God in the other particularly and not only in the same but seeing god across the border and across the political divide and across the racial divide and if we can't see god there then yeah. then we're really just lost I, there's a there's a great sufi story and you'll you'll correct me on the details of of a, a prince who was trying to get enlightened a, a muslim prince and uh, he brings in a sufi master to try and help him on his spiritual path and the master sets his uh, mm -hmm. sends his guards to go looking for for an object which was lost and he sends them on the roof to go find it and he asks him why are you looking on the roof to find this object and he says well because the the moonlight is very good on the roof and uh, he says but but the object wasn't lost on the roof the object was lost here you know in the inside the palace indoors and then the prince realized that that his lesson was that if you're looking for god where it's comfortable and where it's nice and where there's you know good moonlight you're not going to find him out there. You're not going to find him in some other place. And I think very often we, we, we look mm -hmm. for God in places that are sometimes, you know, too easy and too comfortable, which leads sometimes to sort of this spiritual narcissism, which just, as you said, a religion that just builds up the ego instead of slowly dismantling it. 
but instead finding religion and finding God in hard places in, in the other and in the people yeah. and in, and in the, the plants and the animals that we, we don't, you know, necessarily want to identify with and, and connect with. But, uh, that's a really, that's a very, that's a very, it's a challenging message. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's a very potent one for, for today. Um, I'm really curious. I wanted to ask you about your experience over Ramadan, which must have been one of the most bizarre Ramadans in your life because of because everyone was stuck indoors with the virus. And I was curious to know about, and I mean, Ramadan is supposed to be a time for of introspection and introspection plus isolation. They're like real siblings. So I was curious to know how that time was for you and what, what insights you learned from it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a... Thank you, Zevi. Um, this was really an interesting Ramadan, and, and uh, I think really also a very blessed one for for many people. You know, Ramadan over the years, over the centuries, has become to know. It's come to become. It has come to be experienced as very celebratory. There's a lot of communal worship, communal breaking of fast, and so you're always surrounded by a lot of people generally. But this Ramadan was unique, and that for the first time in in history. Yeah, probably every mosque on the planet has been closed and shut down. Yeah. And so we've had no choice but to experience the fast and this entire month of spiritual power and potency independently and in isolation. And what I felt is that this was taking us back to the very birth and origin of Islam, which was when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the month of Ramadan was in isolation and in seclusion in a cave above Mecca, as had become his practice over the years, he would often take a few days or so out of the month to, to isolate himself away from the city and from the chaos and to meditate and to reflect and to really just uh, seek truth, to seek to connect his heart with his source. And this Ramadan was reminiscent of that, which I think is also a very forgotten aspect of our faith and our religion because we become again so externally focused, we tend to, you know, and we forget that Islam was revealed over a period of 23 years and that the practices of Islam, such as the prayers and the fasting and the Hajj and so on, these were all codified at the very end, you know, in the, in the second half of the, of the time of the Prophet Sallallahu beginning with the prayer and ultimately culminating with the Hajj as the final aspect of the religion. And we forget how Islam began how the connection between man and God was established. It was in isolation. It was in seclusion. It was in meditation and in reflection and contemplation, really in, in a deep experience of just presence and surrender. And I believe that this Ramadan was a unique opportunity for us as Muslims, at least, and really for all of humanity to get back to that because we're left with nobody but at the end but God. You know, we're separated even from relatives, friends, uh, distractions. I mean, at the end, if, if one is a spiritual person and a practicing person, a religious person, this really was a unique time to develop our relationship with God and not just go through the motions, right. but to get back to the, to the reality of what the religion is meant to be about. It's really beautiful, that, that chance to, to really go inside and be inside. I feel like, and, and I'm, I'm curious, to know what this was like for you, but I, I feel like so much of religious practice, because it's done communally and in shared spaces, and there's like a real sense of sometimes of like showing off one's religiosity to the other, of like, uh, look how look how well I can pray, look how long I can fast. Like there's sort of this uh, this showmanship yeah. in religion. I see that in, in Judaism definitely, and something it's an event like Ramadan yeah. when it's done to indoors where there's no one to show off to, there's no one to see, there's no one to, you know, to like impress. It's really just, just, you know, one and, and, and God. Yeah. That's very true, Brother Zevi. That's, that's exactly true because this is one of the great pitfalls of religious practice is that it leads to arrogance and egoism and self-righteousness mm. and uh, holier, sort of this holier than thou mentality. It's very dangerous because if we, if a human being, thinks that they are superior to another based on their, you know, observance of religious practices, what we may fail to realize is that that is the exact mistake that in the Islamic and the Quranic tradition, 
What is the exact mistake that Satan made? He thought he was better than Adam, you know, and superior to Adam, and for various reasons, including his very constitution and his, his makeup. And, you know, the, the danger of arrogance and ego, it can render all of our faith and practice worthless and useless in the presence of God. Hmm. Because the prophet of Allah, he, he taught that the only way to approach God is through humility. And this is why the Islamic prayer is manifests as prostration, as the apex of the yes. prayer. Right? But with the forehead to the ground, putting the self down, putting the ego down, surrendering the self, and really humbling the self. This is the only way to, to approach God. Right. And so, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, I think that's very true. There's that great danger. And this is why the, great, the, the teachers of Islamic tradition have always emphasized the importance of the inner dimension as well as the outward dimension. If you take just the outward dimension of Islam, you will, they said you will end up becoming a hypocrite. Mm. And of course, if you do just, you know, then you also have this kind of idea sometimes of people that just want to be spiritual, but want no right. discipline in their lives. Right. Right. And, um, and then the, the great, you know, teachers have also said that will lead you into, uh, you know, one will lead you to the corruption of the, of the self soul. The other one will lead to the corruption of the culture and the community, the lifestyle, mm. the religion. Mm. He said, only by carrying both can a human being yes. reach the goal, which is yes. the truth. Yeah, that's yeah. a very, it's a really fascinating tension. I mean, and as, as someone who's been studying mysticism historically, looking at the way that mystics have often, you know, found ways of, of working with their more orthodox compatriots and brothers to find, I mean, yeah, it's quite, it's quite an interesting interplay. And I'm curious to know also in, in a contemporary world, someone like yourself who's you know so so much of a strong and beautiful advocate for the soul of islam do you find opposition from people that are more focused on the what we would call the body of islam the the sharia and the external elements or is there is there a marriage that's made in a respect for for those two sides that's a very insightful question yeah, I would say that the overwhelming response that, I, you know, when I first began sort of communicating and, and sharing content online a number of years ago, I wasn't sure how it would be received because I knew I was going to be talking about topics that at that time, especially, this is almost eight, nine years ago, were not really spoken of uh, openly as much, for example, right. meditation in Islam. Right. And I'm happy to say that the overwhelming response has been incredibly positive and supportive and i've gotten so much feedback over the years from people that have been very grateful for this message and this work at the same time there are always those who unfortunately um, have allowed themselves to be conditioned by a very narrow-minded interpretation of faith and religion mm -hmm. that every now and then you, you know i do Again, the overwhelming is positive, but I would say not even 1%, maybe less than 1%. There is always those that then do sort of express their opinions of their beliefs. And they're really generally uneducated. You know, I have, for example, a video about Sufism. And I, I think that most of the people that have been negative on that probably didn't even bother to, to listen to five, you know, five minutes of that video, which is quite long. It's almost 40 minutes long trying to explain what is Sufism. And, uh, you know, you can see comments in there and they have nothing to do with the video. They have nothing to do with the content presented. They're just based on stereotype and, and strange ideas that have nothing to do with reality. Yeah. And uh, so that, that does exist. But it's, the, the amazing thing is that that is not actually what has historically and traditionally been considered orthodox Islam. Hmm. Orthodox Islam, for the bulk of our history, has honored the outer and the inner hmm. as vital and essential components. Uh, traditionally, you would have a madhab, which means your school of practice in terms of the outward dimension of the religion. Right? This, would, this is the school that you followed in terms of how to pray, how to fast, how to wash, and so on. And then there was always also the inner dimension, the tariqah that a person would have. And this was the school or lineage that you would have taken for your spiritual development. One is for the outer, one is for the right. inner. Right. So there are generally, you know, four canonical schools of outward practice and 41 orders wow. of the inward dimension, wow. 41 Sufi orders. And generally people would have, you know, would, would adhere to one or the other. I mean, one of each. Right. This may be a personal question following on what you just said and, and feel free to, to take it and to, to answer as you please. 
I'm curious in, in your own spiritual journey, in your own path, coming to, to know Islam and come to appreciate the inner and the outer aspects. Has there been any points of tension or conflict, discrepancies between the inner and outer paths in your own journey, in your own practice? I wouldn't say there's been uh, really any discrepancies because they deal with different dimensions of the faith. So they don't really, you know, the, the areas of, of knowledge and scholarship and focus don't really overlap. But there was tension in the very beginning because some of the way that Islam, you know, generally when people are not educated, the way that they may absorb Islam or learn about Islam from people around them also includes practice as well as belief, aspects of belief or aqidah. And not being sort of well-educated, it's easier for a human being, for, for someone learning about religion, to adopt these sort of really what are more modern innovations in the religion in the last 100, 200 years that have come out of a very, like I said, a narrow-minded and um, unorthodox interpretation of Islam. So from that school of thought, I, you know, I was influenced, even though it never felt right, but there was this influence that was, again, lacking mercy, lacking compassion, lacking light, love, and beauty. And when I was beginning to study Sufism, I was actually bringing it back to the original sources of our religion and the original belief systems. And, you know, there was some tension in the beginning simply because of what I had learned and what I was learning. Mm. And, you know, really the, the path for me was about getting back to the original way of the prophet, the original way of the original inheritors and successors of the prophet, rather than some innovated new ideology that's only been around for less than a couple hundred years. Mm. Unfortunately, people who are not studying, I think now information is so much more available and accessible than it was 10, 20 years ago, that this may be less of a problem now, and I think it is. But back then, you know, you had very limited access to material, right. especially in right. English right. And resources. And a lot of it was, you know, funded by a, a few wealthy countries that, that adhere to a very particular, right. narrow-minded understanding and interpretation of Islam. Right, right. Yeah, that's so important to, to have those resources and have those skills to go back to the sources and to really examine for oneself. I mean, I, I can't imagine exploring Judaism without being able to go back to original sources and not rely on just what people on the streets say. It's so, it's so important. And I think that's a really important point. And that really creates a, uh, a much more robust and healthy form of religion, one which isn't informed by opinion and, you know, what's, what's the, the popular take at the moment. That's a really interesting... I, have, I actually have something like a personal question. And, and I'm curious, because the way that Judaism and, and Islam have conceptualized God has often been so similar historically and, and been in such a close theological and historical relationship. I'm curious to know if this point has come up for you. I find that there's a certain way that God is framed in, in more popular, let's say, the body of Judaism, which is more, going back you know, all the way to the Bible, which is sometimes more of a, let's say, there's a theology which is, which is more compatible for, for the masses and for children which is sort of a very simplistic idea of sort of a, a patriarchal father, a monarchical figure in heaven who can sort of hear mm -hmm. your prayers and respond and take care of the enemy. And, and then when you read the Jewish mystics, they have, you know, a, a radically different idea of God. It's God as the, as the infinite, God as, you know, the life itself, God as being and non-being. Like it's, it's a really abstracted idea. And it's no longer this simple father mm -hmm. or, or kingly figure. Has there, have, have you found that there's been sort of a split idea of what God meant to you before studying Sufism and now? And is, is, there, is there any sort of tension there? Yeah, really good question again. And I would say the tension is trying to balance those two understandings, to not abandon one or the other, mm -hmm. because they're, I think they're both necessary. Mm -hmm. So the... the People of you know Islamic knowledge and scholarship, the scholars, the the pious would say that all, God Almighty manifests in two different uh, qualities. One is Jalal, which is majestic, overwhelming, you know, powerful, uh, glory glorified. The other one is Jamal, which is beautiful and soft, and and and, and so on. And that 
you know, in Islam, in, in the sort of Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, which we recite continually, we're always praying to walk on the straight path, to walk upon the Surat al Mustaqim. And that is by definition a path of balance. To be upright, right, the, the same root word for, for straight and uprightness, it's the same root in the Arabic language. And so to be on the straight path means to be in both form and in spirit upright. And to be upright means to be in balance. So there's this perfect state of balance between these polar opposites or these polar opposite experiences. And I think I've come to realize that we have to be able to relate to God in both ways. And God must be presented as such again, because people are at different stages of the journey. You can't explain things to a child that you can explain to somebody that has lived 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So they need to be able to relate, you know, to the creator and to God uh, at whatever level and stage that they're at. And we can't lose that. Yes. Otherwise we lose, I think, a, a key aspect of, of the path. That's, that was, that was really helpful that actually. Sense. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. It was, it was, it was really helpful. And also really, I'm, I'm so appreciative that like, there's, there's a space where I can come to you as, as a fellow seeker who is, you know, a couple of years down the path further than me with more experience and knowledge and ask, and ask questions that are, are troubling me in my own practice and get an answer that really resonates and really speaks to me and something that I can really take back to my Jewish practice and work with is that this, this capacity to, to translate and to, to share yeah. between the traditions is something which is, is just so, I think it's so incredible. I think it's so, and uh, yeah, and the, the, the need to, to hold on to both and not suppress one in light of the other, but to make space for both the majestic and the soft. That's a really, um, yeah. that's a really beautiful way of putting it. I'm, I'm curious to know what practices you found particularly helpful in your own spiritual practice and connecting with mm -hmm. God uh, and bringing that presence oh. and that softness in, into your own life. Yeah, great, uh, Zavi. I, I would say that the quintessential practice, which uh, I guess has come to be known amongst the Sufis, and I put that again in quotations because Sufism really is but the spirituality of faith, right? You can't have a soul without a body nor a body without a soul. Right. But, uh, but the quintessential practice that, that is usually associated with the spirituality of Islam is known as dhikr, which means remembrance. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, this can be manifest in different ways usually in the repetition or the meditation upon God's divine names and attributes, as well as key phrases, either individually, alone, or collectively in a group. And that's a very beautiful uh, and, and really profound spiritual practice in which a seeker or a, or a believer is seeking to harmonize their state, their energy, their soul, the, the vibration of their being, with these sacred sounds and attributes of God that are really primordial, what I would describe as primordial. What's the word? Sometimes words fail. Uh, energy, vibration, sound, or, sure. or, or energy, really. So th that is known as dhikr, which again means to remember God, mm -hmm. either on the tongue or silently in the heart. So it manifests even thicker. This essential practice manifests outwardly and inwardly. Hmm. And one of our one of the great teachers of Islam, his name was uh, Shah Bahauddin Naqshban. He emphasized on the inner dhikr, the inner meditative practice, hmm. and saying that you know, of course, there's great and both are necessary again. But but the inner is ultimately where you're going to find far greater effectiveness and success and power and openings of the heart towards the divine presence of God, because now you're going inward. Mm. And so he emphasized, and, and within that tradition, within the lineage that I have been you know, fortunate enough to, to come across and to take, there was always this great emphasis on meditative practice, meditation and meditative practice. And these are different forms of dhikr, ultimately culminating in just pure, absolute stillness and surrender, where the dhikr that one is doing is, is a dhikr that is not even intentional. It's not something that I'm doing, but it's the dhikr that my heart is doing, mm. that the heart itself is continually doing, which it must be doing in order to be alive. 
So right. one of the principles of Islam and, and that are in the Quran is that all of creation exists through the glorification of God. So even whether we're aware of it or not, our cells are continually glorifying God by their very existence. Right. Every atom, every particle, every, everything is continually humming and singing the praises of God. And if we can get to a point of stillness and surrender of silence that is deep enough, that then becomes our experience. We begin to be able to experience the glorification of God within our own beings. And that's the glorification that's absolute and pure and perfect. And that leads directly into transcendent states of, of, of nearness to God, mm. I would say. Wow. So, so dhikr in general, and that's how I would maybe try to describe the two aspects of dhikr with the focus on the inner dimension mm. or, or the preeminence of the inner aspect of dhikr Allah, dhikr. of meditation and, and mindfulness. And remembrance. It, wow. It reminds me of a, a verse in, in, in Psalms and Tehillim where King David says, All of my bones, my whole being will proclaim, O Lord, who is like you. It's like the very, the very movement yeah, of our bodies, yeah. the very state of our being. So, and I'm curious to know how that manifests for you in reality, in terms of obviously there's the perpetual zikr, which I love that idea of being perpetually in a state of humility and prayer and gratitude and remembrance. Uh, but in terms of actually taking moments of silence, how does that, what does that look like for you practically? Is that, is that once a week? Is that, how does that manifest? So normally and ideally it would be daily mm -hmm. and the time of the day there are certain times of the day that are considered much more spiritually potent than other times mm -hmm. and generally around the rising and the setting of the sun. Right. So one of the most potent times is the early morning before sunrise, the, the dawn period and just before even that last third of the night, which the Prophet ﷺ described as being very particularly special. Um, so normally, um, and you know, not, we're not perfect, but normally the goal is for me personally is to be up at that time. Mm -hmm. And to spend that time for in prayer and meditation. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, that are sort of described in the Quran is the alternation of day and night mm. of the sun and the moon, and that this has also again been understood by the people of knowledge as the day being the outward aspect of our lives. Like that's what we see physically. That's sort mm. of the, the time of the form, and, and that's the time for our worldly life. But the night. And the moon represents spirituality. And those are the times that are most potent for, for spiritual practice. So generally, the early morning, I would say, on a good day, I would be up, you know, early in the morning, let's say, you know, before dawn, and to spend some time in, in dhikr, and in both forms of dhikr, in the re repetition and recitation of God's names and attributes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then transitioning into just a period of complete stillness. Mm. You know, and that could be anywhere from, 15 20 minutes to an hour and that would be that aspect of, of that practice in addition to you know of course the obligatory prayers and some of sure. the uh supererogatory prayers sure. that that take place in the night and in the morning as well wow. but really just um i would say at least an hour or so a day in nice. some sort of meditative practice that, and i'm sure giving that time in the beginning of your day really sets the rest of your day in with the right meditation with the right headspace yeah. I'm sure that I'm sure it makes, really, a, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Days that begin like that are, are markedly different than days that, that don't. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, um, I, I could, I could testify the same from experience when, when I have a successful morning prayer, successful shakrit, the, the rest of the day is a different day. I'm curious. I'm very curious about the sort of the inner and the psychological experience in these moments, because I believe that even though, you know, a Muslim will be doing zikr by repeating the name of God and a Jew will be, doing a morning prayer and a Christian will be doing a morning prayer differently, that there's some sort of, because the human brain is fundamentally the same, that, that there's some sort of base psychological experience that's generated. I'm curious to know uh, if you could give some sort of description of what that means, what that does for you internally, uh, both during and, and then following the experience. Yeah, great. So I think that what that experience ultimately can be described as is one of peace and presence. Mm. of connectedness, mm. of, of fullness. You know, because the idea is that when we are remembering God, we are forgetting ourselves. Mm. 
And for the, for that period in time, we are taking the focus off of ourselves, which right. is our primary preoccupation. Right. So just, uh, you know, one of the, the, the fundamental pillars of faith, which is exactly the same in Judaism and Islam, is that there is no God but God, that right. they, they shall have no gods before me. And historically, of course, that manifested in, ter- in the form of physical idols. People would create works of their own hands and then worship them, which really are nothing other than, if you think about it, projections of ourselves. Right. Characteristics of ourselves that we're projecting right. into some sort of physical form and then worshiping that. Right. Ultimately, the self is the, is the false god that we must seek liberation from. Mm. Our own selves, our own thoughts, our own minds, our own beings, our own egos. And so when we're able to do that through meditative and spiritual practice, whether it's Christian or Jewish or Muslim prayer or meditation, the focus is on God. The focus is on the creator. And we're disconnecting from the self. And we're, so in Islam, we have to have a qibla, which means a direction of prayer. And so, of course, on the outward level, that means facing towards Mecca when we offer the, the ritual prayers. Mm-hmm. But there must also be a heart qibla for the heart. Mm in a direction for the heart. And unfortunately, the direction of the heart is usually pointing towards the self, hmm. towards me, right? right? Our whole worlds are revolving, unfortunately, around I. Right. And so if, if spiritual practice, especially dhikr and, and that type of practice, it really helps to take the focus off of the self and to allow the self to just be quiet and surrendered. And so, you know, over time, over years of, of practice, one becomes increasingly more present and less self-ish or self, there's less self-active. Right, right. So that, that makes possible uh, living life with greater connectedness and, and nearness to God. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I think that people that don't get a chance to separate from the self and to stop thinking about themselves for a second, that haven't, didn't know that that was possible, don't realize how how peaceful and how how beautiful of an experience that is to stop just worrying about this self for, for just a second or for just an hour in the morning. That's I can yeah. imagine the serenity that, yeah. that comes with that. Absolutely. And this is why I think the Buddha said life is suffering. Mm. Life is suffering because life is the normal human experience, which is based in that state of consciousness that is rooted in the self. Mm. It's going to be suffering. Yeah. This is why we as a culture now are so distracted and, and yes. so entertained Yes, because we just can't be by ourselves. The, yeah. It's just a source of constant suffering yeah. that we're trying to escape from. <laughs> it's and the craziest thing. So, yeah. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, one of the, uh, I know you've, I think you've touched on this in some of, or you've referenced this, it's been referenced in some of your videos, the different states of the self. Right. Um, I know it came up in one of the discussions you had. In, in, in Islam, there's this Quranic model, the nafs al-amara, nafs al and nafs al three states of consciousness. And, and that middle one sort of being what we would equate with, with the mind-based sense of self, the, the state mm. of consciousness for generally for human beings. It's a very problematic state to exist in because mm. the mind causes so much suffering. In fact, suffering is by definition the experience of the mind. Mm. Suffering and pain are two different things. And so we're always trying to escape ourselves. Mm. But the spiritual path and religion is, is meant, I believe, to show us the way to go beyond the self, to transcend the self, to go forward and upward. But the alternative is to go backwards and to regress in consciousness and in awareness. So we're almost trying to go back to a more primitive level of consciousness mm-hmm. through drugs and alcohol and entertainment and, and yeah. whatever, yeah. through addictions we're trying to actually suppress consciousness rather than to transcend this problematic state of consciousness, right. which is rooted in suffering, right. which is rooted in the self. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a really, it's a really nice way to put it. And it's really also great to have a system where you could see and evaluate one's own position and, and have an aim of where one wants to be having that a roadmap almost it's such a valuable thing. And the idea of, of the various nafs in Sufism is, is really such a perfect system. Yeah as yeah as i've seen it in many other traditions i am co- trying to be conscious of your time I, I asked for an hour of it and i think we're coming in an hour okay. so i want to i want to just end with with two questions one is going to be more of a personal question for me and i get to part of the the great thing of having this channel is i get to have great people like yourself and get to ask them questions that that help me and hopefully mm-hmm. other people that get to listen uh, the two questions are one 
in in a day and age where religion is often identified with so much darkness and backwardness and violence and, and when people think of religion they don't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind isn't peace and light and love what do we do to to change it and how do we put ourselves forward with people that want to be advancing consciousness and and expanding love and uh and moving away from ego that, that's one question and the second one and i'm asking together because they may be relevant uh, to one another is <laughs> and this kind of a paradox here where the, the project of mysticism in at least one way of phrasing it is to deconstruct is to take apart the ego and allow god in instead and the irony of having mm. and, and this is speaking from my own experience and i'm curious to know how you've been dealing with this the irony of having a youtube channel uh, or a podcast which is about removing the ego which is and but the channel is like all about the self and here's my face and here's my opinion yeah. and here's me and i have to promote it and i have to get people to, to like it and share it how do you balance uh, <laughs> that? It's such a, like, it's, it's the most bizarre tension. And then, and then what, what are the most, what are the successful methods that you found to, to share your message and, and to change people's understanding what it means to be religious and what it means to be, to be a Muslim? So I'll, I'll address that second question that you had first, which is one that I actually, you know, kind of struggle with a lot because especially in in our way in our path and, and with my training it was really about ultimately becoming nothing yeah. non-existent yes you know and and to sort of put yourself out there as anything is inherently something that was very uncomfortable for me to do but there was a deeper part of me saying that this needs to be done mm -hmm. and and i struggle with that for quite a bit in terms of you know, putting myself out there, putting my name. And that's why I've spoken so little about myself personally. I just generally try to present ideas and concepts. Um, but I realize also it's necessary because people need to relate to people. People need to, you know, get, get content and information from people. And I've realized I just have to get out of my own way. Like, and this really is actually a part of the development, right? Because you've got one aspect of the self that, um, that holds you back from your potential as an awakened and, and God conscious human being, which is the overt aspect of the self that look at me, I'm, I'm here I am, you know, and, and this is what I am bringing to the value to the world. Right. So that's sort of the overt ego, but there's also the other side, which is imbalanced again, uh, in terms of self deprecation. And they're both, they're both strong associations and attachments to the self. So this is also, again, what Buddha spoke of and what the Prophet Muhammad saw some spoke of, the middle way, the middle path. And I realized me not doing what needed to be done was still in a strong attachment to my sense of self. Right. Right. So it was about ultimately get out of your own way, get out of the way, really, and just do what needs mm -hmm. to be done and take yourself mm -hmm. out of the equation. Yeah, yeah. So it has been a struggle of the years and it has slowed me down quite a bit in terms of projects and things that I would have liked to have that I that I felt needed to be done but again that's just my own personal development and um, I guess gradually growing into the ability to be out there and yet not personalize anything mm -hmm. one of the advantages of studying with a traditional teacher is that sometimes they break you down so definitively and so thoroughly that it becomes almost impossible to after that try to associate anything to yourself <laughs> i mean i get you know like i get comments for example and and emails and messages and stuff and um you know i read them and like wow that's amazing is that possible that, that i'm bringing so much value to this person's mm. life and then uh and then i forget it like i can't remember it i can't hold on to those things mm. i can't say oh look at the great work i'm doing right it just doesn't register anymore right i mean i, I feel kind of weird saying that but this is something that i've sort of thought about myself and and um, you ask the question, so it is coming up. You know, part of the, the destruction of the self is that I think at a point, it just uh, it isn't able to lash on to anything personally. It can't derive any benefit from it because you know yourself. Right. But you know that ultimately you are nothing. So it doesn't matter what people say about you or how much attention or likes or subscribers you get. You know, it, it, it doesn't mean anything at some point. Right. Uh, so there's that. And... I hope that's useful to you uh, and, and just in general people that maybe are struggling with this because it is a real issue. It, there's almost this inherent 
tension between try to do something spiritual and do it in the world and especially yeah. in a way that to operate within the paradigms of the world it's very challenging yes definitely yeah no i think that is a very helpful message and i'm sure people that are you know mm -hmm. considering sharing will will be something which will help them move forward the the desire to not share because of ego is also ego related and, and really just to do what needs to be yeah. done and, and not consider the self and there's definitely yeah. There's so much sharing to be done, and there's so much people with with wisdom and with beauty that, that need to begin sharing, I believe. Yeah, and it's, it can again really be helpful to have a good teacher. They mm -hmm. can always kind of keep you in check, keep you grounded, right? right. Or a yes, or, or a good spouse or partner. <laughs> that, will... that that too. Life will do it one way or the other. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so to uh, to bring, I missed. Yeah, sorry. Your first question, if you wanted yeah, to, just the, quickly. the first question is: I'm curious to know. So, there's kind of the two sides here. I asked about your own, your own practice, um, about your own zikr, which which was really nice to hear, and definitely something which I'm going to take, you know, and try to implement myself. I'm curious about about trying to reach uh, someone who's not familiar with the tradition, someone who's not acquainted with the the beauty of of the the soul of Islam or the soul of any tradition for that matter. Where do you see mm -hmm. sort of a, an entry point? Because because people, I mean, people today don't want to hear about religion, don't want to hear about God. It's, it's yeah. them, they think that you're yeah, a dinosaur. Right. So, yeah. Where, where yeah. do you find a point of entry to people's hearts? Yeah, that's so interesting because so much of that is just disinformation and, and sort of this strange world that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, if we, like religion is painted in such a negative light especially in the West, it's very strange because the amount of suffering that we have created for ourselves outside of religion is infinitely far worse than anything that has been done within religion. And it wasn't religious people that launched the first world wars or dropped the bomb on, you know, the nuclear bomb or any of these things. In it. But somehow we tend to forget this. I mean, the, look how many people died uh, and, and were horribly abused as a result of the, the opposite of religion. In, in, you know the soviet union and prior right. so it's a strange thing but i would say that the, the best thing that we can do we have to be we have to be the way right like we've got to be the be the thing and to unapologetically be so yeah you know to to communicate clearly and intelligently articulately as as, as best as possible but to be firmly rooted in our tradition not to water it down yeah uh, so long as one is educated, they understand what they're doing. It's not just blind faith necessarily, but, you know, and, and it's a process of perpetual growth. But to be firmly anchored and rooted, I would say, in religion and in faith and to do the best to, uh, to be that first and foremost, the result of it, right? Not just to sort of uh, project or try to communicate an ideological position, which is really not of much value, right. but ultimately it comes down to being the result of that tradition, right. which I would say again, goes back to being a human being that is excellent. Mm. You know, a person that, that is going to be able to stand in front of their creator with hopefully as little regret as possible right. in the way that they manifested in this world, in the, in the way that they treated others, in the, the way that, that they related with others, in the way that they made others feel, to be that and to see that as the product of religion. Right. So as I was saying earlier, when we were with our master, with our teacher, our chef, you know, Zebi, there's a, there's a unique kind of light that, that can only be attracted and cultivated through prophetic paths and prophetic channels. There's a very unique type of light. It's a divine light that flows through the, from the presence of God, through the hearts of the prophets of God, to their communities. That is our point of access. And when a human being sees that, it's undeniable and it's unmistakable. So when we would walk with our sheikh, with our teacher, he was one of those people that were carrying that type of divine light. And it shone so clearly and brightly that I would see people crossing the street just to ask him, who are you? Like mm. they've never seen anyone like this. Mm. Like physically they look different than the average mm. human being. They're luminous. And that is what attracts human beings. Hmm. We don't need people to agree with us conceptually, intellectually, right. ideologically. What we need is the world to improve and to reconnect with its source and its creator through prophetic channels. And I think the best way that we can do that is to be 
good and God willing, sincere and righteous representatives of the prophets of God mm. by walking in their first step truly and sincerely first and foremost. And, and this is how in the earlier history of Islam, this is how Islam spread. They were such pure and humble and pious and sincere people that in many of the lands that they went to, people were just attracted to them magnetically right. Right. because of the light that was on, on their faces and on their beings. Right. They weren't, they didn't speak the language in many of the places they, they, they went to as traders and as merchants. And um, I think that that is maybe the most important thing for us as, for people as religious people, especially people of faith hmm. be, you know, as Jesus alayhi salam, intended you to be, or as Moses alayhi salam, peace be upon them intended to be as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, intended us to be, hmm. be a representative of the prophets, not just one that is identified right. with their tradition. Right. I have to say, son, I, when I was listening to your material and to your podcast, both from you and your guests, I really felt that light that you described emanating from your voices. Mm -hmm. And I really felt the, the authenticity and the, the thoroughness of the messages that they weren't just words being parroted off. They weren't just ideologies being shed, but they were really words coming from the core of, of, of who you were and who your guests were. And it really elevated me. It really, it really did uh, lift me up. And, and particularly because it was so deeply Muslim, it, it wasn't an attempt to, to make it accessible or, or compatible or, or watered down. It was, it was so deeply rooted in, in your own tradition and in the beauty and depth of that. And in such a thorough way that spoke to such good and true human values about, you know, getting away from ego, egoism and, and selfishness and jealousy and hatred and ideas that we can all really connect to and ideas which you really need coming from a place of such, of such depth and sincerity. And I, I really felt I had this kind of image of like a, an old sheikh from like, I don't know, the 12th to 13th century that really just walked the talk and really just, you know, moved with the wisdom of the Quran and with the, the beauty of, of the religion. And I think you're really, I think you're really, really embodying that in, in a modern day and age where it's so, it's like, it's really rare to find such uh, authenticity and such sincerity. And, and I think, I really do think that it's, it's applicable, not just to, to Muslims. I really do think that someone who's authentically Christian could inspire someone in their own Muslim practice and someone who's authentically uh, Muslim could inspire a Jew in their own practice and someone who's, who's being deeply Buddhist could inspire a Muslim to, to be closer to Allah. I, I really do think that, uh, that there's a real possibility. And on that note, uh, I wanted to invite you to share where people can find your material, can find your content, because I found it, I found it deeply uplifting and inspiring. And I want people to have a chance to, to find your, your words and to hopefully let it reach their hearts as well. Well, thank you, Azavi. That's one of the beautiful, most beautiful things anybody's uh, ever said that I can recall, uh, especially, again, coming from, you know, um, a parallel tradition and path. I'm very humbled to hear that, and thank you for that. And if anything, I would say that that is just simply the, the, the barakah or the blessing of, uh, of our teachers and of our lineage, of mm. the people that we were able to study and sit with and learn from and absorb from. And I pray that, if anything, you know, that their light, and their spirit, which ultimately is a prophetic light, you know, from the prophet, that is able to be transmitted through the work that we do. So uh, thank you for that, Zevi. Uh, in terms of uh, connecting, yeah, we have, of course, the uh, Soul of Islam radio podcast, which is uh, available. That can be found on iTunes or just uh, on most platforms. You can look it up for more information at soulofislamradio.com. And then uh, my primary website at the moment is spiritualexcellence.com. And uh, therein I've got, you know, that's where I do a lot of my courses and content and online training programs. Um, just means of trying to communicate and, and work with people uh, in this domain. And then, uh, of course, the, the YouTube channel is another resource. So maybe you can uh, have a link to that as well in your, in your description. Oh, I'll, I'm going to link all um, of this in the yeah. description. Sure. Fantastic. Yeah. And yeah, that will be the, the three main things. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, yeah. And I, I really can't recommend it enough. I really can't. Even, even if someone really has, has no particular interest in Islam itself, I just think that the core spirituality and the core authenticity shines through in it. And it's something which transcends the, the particularity. But, and, but I think more than it just transcends the particularity, it's manifest through the particularity in a, in a very, in sort of this paradoxical way where the most mm -hmm. universal is found in, in the most particular. And I think that's an amazing place mm. to be in. And I think you're really achieving that very well. So Isan, thank you so, so much wow. for giving okay. us of your precious time and from sharing your light and wisdom with us. 
And I want to know yeah, if you have thank any... Thank you as well, Zevi. It's been really a pleasure. It's been a joy to speak with you. I'm so glad to hear. Do you have any, do you have any final words for, for the listeners? Any, any parting thoughts? I would simply say to, to do your best as human beings to awaken our hearts to love, to unity, to harmony amongst, other, amongst one another. And that we don't all have to be the same in order to be brothers and sisters. And in mm -hmm. fact, I think that that is the beauty of what we are capable of, mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, be different, but at the same time in harmony and resonance with one another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the root of all of our traditions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, and again, I'm not sure when this will finally be aired, but right now we're, we're living in a time when that message is so, it feels like, it's a message which is going to be like a, like a cold cup of water to, to a thirsty person if it can be really drunk up by, by the people, mm -hmm. by all of us, really, that, that, that need to hear it. Inshallah. Thank you so, so much. Inshallah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Zevi. I look forward to, again, uh, hopefully having you on, on my podcast or show at some point soon. Absolute and, pleasure. Uh, this has been a real pleasure. It's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you, Issam.